to begin, I'm just going to show you something extra, free pre-show. This is um, this is something I did with the Dictionary of Tunes, mm -hmm. which I did mention yesterday. Um, but Dennis Parsons did this Dictionary of Music, which consists of um, you listen to the tune and you decide whether it goes down, up, or stays the same. So. One piece of music, only one in the world goes down, 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 with 15 notes. It turns out, hey, it's a song, Piano Concerto number four. Um, and these are other entries from the dictionary. And it's kind of crazy, stupid, and simple. And you can understand how it works straight away, which is why um, Andre Previn said it was actually funny. It's so simple. So. And he does pop music, pop tunes too. So Oklahoma is down, 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 up, up, remains the same, down, up, and so on. And Dennis Parvins used to do a, a routine where he would name that tune, but he secretly had a dictionary inside me. Okay, so you can, you can represent a tune graphically. That's Mary Has a Little Lamb. And then you can add all the tunes in the world up one stack them, one on top of the other. So that one on the, on the bottom right is the saint song tune that goes down, 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 down for 15 notes. But most tunes end up more or less in the middle. And then I made it as a model, and that is Beethoven, Bach, and um, the one on the right is pop music, the one on the left is classical tunes, so that's a model of music. That's all the 9,400 classical tunes in the world in a, in, a, in a plastic model. There it is, spreading out into Parsons' space, and it makes this amazing checkerboard pattern. There it is. It's the checkerboard of tunes. It feels like a big building. It looks like a... It looks like a Calatrava building. Yeah. You could do the entropy of the... Indeed, you could. Uh, there it is on my desk. It's a thing. Well, John's done letting people in. I think we should start, yes? Yes. Okay. Right, we'll start the afternoon session. I'm ready, yes. Yeah, right. We have start the afternoon session and we have Andrew Compton, The Origin of Flowers. Right, you have an hour. Thank you very much. What I'm going to talk about today, in this confined space where I can't see what I'm putting on the screen, is, um, is to do with nothing. Um, and I, I would like to explain, in so, can I contextualise this a little bit? I can do this bit without pictures because for many years, for decades, I've been interested in nothing, and objects, uh, uh, objects that are hard to name, objects that are hard to recognize, objects that are hard to remember, hard to advertise. If it's difficult, I'm interested. So, and my, rather than look for this in the laws of physics, I have taken a very pragmatic, uh, sort of pragmatic person, I, I, I make things, I set about trying to construct objects that could not be described. Um, if you look for individual objects that can't be described, they're rather hard to come across, although they, although they do exist. Um, and examples would include for the, the things that André Breton, the André Trouvés, which seem to have no relation to other... If I can say what you're like, if I can describe you metaphorically, I'm not interested. I want things that are just there. So I started trying to construct objects which could not be described. And then I began to discover them in unexpected places. So I dis decided this property of being hard to describe is useful. And I will show you along the way some objects that are hard to describe, that are useful. And then it occurred to me that since this useful property of indescribability, um, if it was real, it ought to exist in nature. So I began to look for it in nature, and I found it, you're going to guess, in, well, in, in several places, but the one I settled on was flowers. Okay. And I'll give you reasons why flowers cannot be described. 
Um, we'll come to that. So, some pictures. Once upon a time, there were no flowers. Everything was just kind of gray. Well, green, I suppose. And then there were flowers. And I want you to understand how very odd, firstly, flowers are before we decide what they're doing. And I want you to remember that nature has no style. Art things have a style, but that's called, uh, opposed to nature. You don't say nature. Well, I'm going to I hope I explain how they do it. Now, a bit more. Well, flowers. Um, there's a lot of this is this is biosemiology. Uh, well, these these are uh, Stafford Beer and Gordon Pask. Um, biological computers. This is um, this is a poem by Stafford Beer. The green computer C with its molecular logic to the system square inch, a bigger brain than mine, writes out foamy equations from the bow across the bland backwater. Which is what you know Peter was saying. Nature does not do maths. Nature is just doing it. Um, okay. These are types and tokens. This is right. And this, what I'm going to say is, sorry, I'm doing this in the wrong order. This is a face. Um, I'm going to have to do this slightly out of order. What I want you to do is understand what an interface is. Um, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to slightly... Don't look at this, don't look at this. It's, first of all, we will, I will explain what the problem is. It's, uh, pollination of plants is a very complicated problem uh, because it's not only done by bees, it's done by beetles and moths and bats and birds and mammals. And plants are, I hope you realize, what they're offering is food for sex. Um, they are, and the food, they offer pollen, which is nutritious, and they offer nectar, which is sugar, and they also offer chemicals they offer shelter, they offer a warmer temperature, but they're offering something in exchange for you taking their pollen. This is the clever bit. They want to give you pollen, but you have to take that pollen to another plant of the same species. You have to be faithful. And if you take the pollen from a daffodil to a tulip, that pollen is wasted, and the, and the daffodil got it wrong. So the problem for a plant is to make sure that an animal takes a reward for sex and takes it to a companion heterospecific species. That's a very clever thing to do, and I want you to wonder how they do it. And, it's a, and the problem is one of communication, of constructing an interface. And this is the origin of flowers. This is a joke <laughs> to do with bees. And because I'm going to talk about the little bees, these are bees in my garden. I want you to understand also how amazing. I'm going to simplify the problem and say I'm going to talk only about bees and flowers. I'm going to ignore all the other different kinds of animals doing it. So I'm going to simplify the problem. It's a kind of proper physicist approach. So I want you to understand how clever bees are. Bees go out scouting for plants. There, there is division of labor in a hive, and a bee will go out and look for, scout bee, good plants. Now, and then they go back to the hive and they do a little dance. They do you've heard this bee dance, and they tell the other bees, the worker bees, where to go and harvest. And here are the worker bees in my garden harvesting the lavender plant. And those will stick with the plant to which they have been allocated and take the, the nectar back. And it is that bee constancy that ensures that the blossom from the lab that the pollen from the lavender goes to a, another lavender plant nearby. So bee constancy is the secret of flowers. There's nothing original about this, this observation, by the way. And we'll come to, what I'm going to come to is how plants are designed to ensure this bee constancy. Um, so the bees... So understand this. Sorry, do some more on bees. A human being has a big, big brain. 
but a bee has only a little, little brain. Bees are so stupid, if you put them in a bottle, they can't escape. Did you notice? A fly will escape because it's so stupid it flies randomly and gets out of the hole. <laughs> Whereas a bee will always go to the light bzz, 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 at the bottom end of the bottle until it dies. Another thing about bees, bees can recognize nothing. Bees can count with their tiny brains they can count numbers, but they can also recognize something is missing. They, can, they have a concept of nothing. This is known because bees are easily trained. Because what they want is sugar. And if you can provide sugar in a dish, they're very tractable. They'll come back and forth to that dish. And then you can move the dish behind a screen and see, make them make choices. And you can see how they think. And the experiments on bees can, you know, we have good understanding of the bee mind. And bees can recognize human faces. Now I want you, this is one of the most amazing things I have ever read. Now if you don't, you know, if you want to stop and think tonight, a bee with a brain smaller than a full stop, not a rack of servers in Utah doing fake recognition with enormous <laughs> algorithm and mega, mega storage of numbers, the bee can do it with a full stop brain, as well as learning waggle dance, building hexagonal hives and flying around. And what this makes me wonder is, is a face the deeper question here? What is a face? This thing of which we don't have, you know, uh, this, um, you know <laughs> this, this head we don't have, we learned this weekend, you know. <laughs> On having no head, you know. <laughs> How do you recognize this thing we don't have? Well, what's recognized? I'm coming to that. What's recognized? It's a hole. Okay. Now, I, I began by saying, I'm try my project began by trying to make objects that could not be described, physically make them. What I was doing in that was, in some way, I, I'd like to think parallel to what Boyle was doing, making a vacuum. In order to stand, understand what is, you have to make what make some. You have to make a nothing, and then once Boyle makes the vacuum, you can understand that actually what we understand about chemistry, we're at the bottom of an atmosphere of air, and it's interfering with understanding what's going on chemically. Likewise. So what I'm trying to do in this is kind of my interest also in Spencer Brown is to construct an intellectual vacuum to make something we can't see. And what I discovered when I tried to do that was that I was making faces. So a face is in a very literal sense a hole. And this brings me to this. Here's something else that's invisible. Think about this, the perfect typeface is invisible. And I want you to understand. It was different. <laughs> Suppose I were to read something. What happens is uh, I look at a page and words come off the page and I see them. But actually, what I'm really looking at are letters. Uh, but I don't see the letters. I only see the letters, in fact, if there's a spelling mistake, when there's a little hitch. Um, that's a little harder with handwriting, and it's a little even harder if you've got a font that is very, very ornate, you know, then it becomes irritating, doesn't it? But if you've got a good font, it vanishes. You see through the font and you see a word. In fact, you don't even see the words. You see through the words and see a sentence. And if you're reading fast, you don't even see the sentences. You see a story. So, comprehension at an interface is to do with making things vanish, whilst preserving a pattern of difference. So when I started making my vacuum, you can maybe see where this is going, what I found was I could do it not with one object, but if I had many objects, then I could join them in such a way that they had no pattern, that they had well, they had to have things in common. I could make what I call self-camouflaged sets. And then 
I get onto things with minimal descriptions, with no pattern, with no metaphorical description. And what I was doing was making alphabets and faces, and they are holes in reality through which you see other things. And I'll show you some slides to show this. So I'm going to have to go, what was that one? This was, it was in the wrong order. Forget that, by the way, is, you can meditate on that. That's a face, and what's on the other side is just a horror show, you know? It's a thing with one side. It's the mark, and it's a face. How do you make the distinction between the unmarked and the mark stake, it takes blood, tendons, muscles, and stuff you never see. And on the front, you have a face through which you see not blood and gore. You see a human being, which is this kind of metaphysical, uh, somewhere else. Okay. This is, how, this is how you read. You skip along. You don't read every letter. I hope you know this. You just take occasional letters and you fill it in, like when your eye darts around a scene, and then you, and you fill in reality, which is how you can be fooled from time to time. And you can even go backwards to check things, but you're unaware of it when you read this, because your mind fills in the script as the way it fills in reality. So how is that done? That's done with an alphabet. And the alphabet is enabling you to do this. This is what you read. You see a letter. The text is the unmarked state, and out of the unmarked state pops up a letter. Then another letter is your focal view scans along the lines, and then the, the, the meaning leaps out at you, and the text is gone. The text is vanishing. So how does the text vanish? Ask yourself, how is it designed? You are probably, think of communication as to do with sussure, where you have a set of differences. And following that, you would naturally imagine, you would easily imagine, that anything can be a sign for anything else. And that is true. Except, not all signs are equally good for us as human beings. So the alphabet, I'm going to say, is designed for human beings to vanish for us. It was not going to vanish for a dog. It's not going to vanish for someone who's autistic. It's not going to vanish for someone who can't read. But if you've learned to read, we have learned to make an alphabet vanish. Now, I, I wrote about this in an article published a few years ago called How to Look at a Reading Font. If you want to look at the details, I'm going to, I could talk about this for hours, but I'm just going to have to skim through this. Um, the fact that letters can't be described, you might like to think, what is harder to draw than a page of type? Type letters are immensely complex, and they're complex because they form a self-camouflaged set. Each letter is camouflaged in the context. They're also immensely slippery. There is no biggest letter. Some of them are in two pieces. Sometimes you get ligatures. Some are, you have capital letters and lowercase. Sometimes capital letters are bigger versions than lowercase. Sometimes there are not. There are no rules. There is no pattern. There is no structure. Peter looks for structure, for groups. In the alphabet, there is nothing. And in, con in, in consequence, if you have a page of text and there's a fly on it, you see the fly. It's just background. And you have this other odd thing that in a page of text, every letter is camouflaged among its companions. Therefore, it, a, a camouflage involves the creation of an image. If I'm camouflaged against this wall, I'm white. If a letter is camouflaged in the rest of text, it resembles the other letters. But it has to be different to be recognized. So it's a pattern of different and similar. So it's all, and it's to a certain extent, self-describing. If I gave you a font, struck a letter out, and said reconstruct it from those that remain, you'd be able to do it. But the font has no pattern. 
Ja. Soll ich? Okay. You can read that if you want. In a, in a contrast set, it's quite a simple computational problem. You just got to recognize a few distinctive features, right? Okay. So this is well, same t same time of day. We had the binary entropy function. The easiest way to make well, I'm, I'm going to show you some some really beautifully designed efficient signs now. Sorry, these the, 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 these are matrices which are maximally different. So the, 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 the columns are all three changes apart. Those are, the, 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 the column vectors are maximally different, right? Oh my god, so I don't have to... I'm going to make some maximally different objects. Look at the matrix on the right. That's a 5, 4, 3... It's, the, the vectors are 5... Got four vectors, five binary numbers long, and they're all three changes apart. Um, I started. Look, sorry, this is a bit of a, to go back a little bit. I started hunting for arrangements of objects which were there, there, were, there wasn't an odd one out. They were uh, there wasn't the biggest. Trying to eliminate pattern. Uh, there's that matrix again. The maximally different. Um, and I got this from Edmund Leach, the sociologist. This is slightly crazy. Those statements are maximally different statements under the rubric of uh, successful murderer, masculine virgin, and dealt with Spain. That's just copy from Edmund Leach, okay? And he says they're very memorable. And they're memorable, in fact, because they all copy features. So, sorry, the point of this is, if you want to be... Mac, um, if you want to be maximally different, if you want to make a field of difference, you have to share features. So, shoes and ships and ceiling wax and cabbages and kings are very different, but they're not maximally different. The point is maximally different for a finite number of variables. You end up with something like this. Okay. Now, here's the same matrix occurring with a very familiar set of signs. Hearts, clubs, diamonds and spades. It actually, it's not perfect. If you, you'd make this better if the heart was black, and sorry, if the, if, the, if the diamond was black and the spade was red, then they would be maximally different. But then I think the heart and the spade are too similar. So it's a bit of a, it's, it's, I think it's the best that can be done. And I was, you know, I have gone through a lot of sign systems looking for these kind of patterns. And I hope you realize how very sophisticated and weird these things are. They are, they share a limited number of simple features like point, round, stalk, inward point, and color. They're maximally different and, get this, when you look at them, they share those, um, when, I, when I did my experiment, I asked people what features do these shapes have and they came out with things like they look like trees, uh, they look like leaves, um, but there's very little else. You're talking here about something about which there is nothing to say. And we have the same property with these sign systems, like in playing cards, that you have with alphabets. There's nothing to say about it. Now, if you don't believe this, sit down with a copy of, say, Times, print out the alphabet, look at it, and say something about it. And if you do manage to say, like, let's say, T is taller than M, I'll show you another font in which it's not true. By the way, I was trying to discover the, the vicinity of hearts, gloves, down and spades, and I could not beat them. These are parallel universes. These are the evolutionary failures. This is what did not happen. Forget that. I hope you realize that not only is the alphabet not describable, but individual letters are not describable. So if I say to you it's a letter O, you'd say a letter O is closed, isn't it? Well, actually, no. And you say it's round. And I say, well, not all the time. And you say it's made of a, it's made of a line, isn't it? And I'd say, no, sometimes that line is more like a surface. Or you say, maybe it's an oval. 
Well, actually, not all the time. There are no rules. It avoids pattern. It avoids description. The letter O is a hole in our perceptual system. Okay? <laughs> you got that? It's a vacuum. It's boiled. Even the letter S. You know, you think you know what shape it is. You don't. So when you have font 1, font 2, font 3, font 3, you have a horizontal, synchronic indescribability, and you have a diachronic indescribability that ends up with this thing called a letter which simply does not have any description except that it is. We know what it is. We can name it. It's a letter S, but we don't know how. We can't say what features. We just know it in distinction to other letters from its context. We, we recognize it from its context, but not anything intrinsic in the thing we're seeing. Therefore, it is coming out of the unmarked state into existence, like that. And I hope you realize this staggering, amazing, uh, two, I've shown you two amazing things today. Firstly, that bees can recognize human faces. Like how? And do you realize that every alphabet in the world descends from one original? which comes out in, the, in um, Sinai, and the, the earliest might be Hebrew, you know, think Moses. The alphabet is serious magic. Um, and they're all related in a tree. Now you might think if the alphabet is a set of arbitrary signs, you could invent your own alphabet. And I say to you, go ahead and try. But you won't be, it's like inventing your own language, it's a kind of Wittgensteinian problem you are outside the network of connections. You just can't have it like a private language, having a private alphabet, it won't work. Which makes it look like an alphabet is a natural object. Which brings us, and you see where this is going when I come back to flowers. Flowers are also a natural alphabet to enable the bees to solve this type token problem. Okay. There's a made-up alphabet. Do you, know what, do you know what language that is? It's Klingon. It's a Trekkie, <laughs> enthusiast alphabet. And it's not real. Okay. These are examples of interfaces formed from contrast sets that are designed to vanish. And before I come to that, Okay, that's handwriting, punctuation, numerals. Sorry, I must have I'm more missing. Oh, let's get back to flowers. Flowers can recognize zero. You have to recognize zero because you're looking for the absence and presence of features. So if you can do that, then with a few set of distinctive features, you can make an alphabet. And then the B can recognize a flower in the same way we can recognize hearts, club, diamond, spades, with four or five simple features. The perfect type will be completely invisible. And Goody, if, you know, that's Goody who designs it. He knows. A flower is a sign. Now, a, a, a fl um, plants pollinate themselves with fruit, and a fruit is a reward and it's obvious, but flowers, you've got to go inside to see if there's any nectar. Flowers can lie. Therefore, their flowers truly are a semiotic object. Think about that. Right. And I want you to observe that all faces make faces. So, human faces it isn't that alphabets are made out of bits of human faces, it's that human faces, alphabets vanish, flowers vanish, a flower in a bun, this is why flower arranging is possible, because flowers vanish amongst other flowers. They are form what I call a self-camouflage set. Uh, I can put it this way, how many unmarked states are there? There can only be one. Therefore, all faces are in all holes, all vacuums are the same. So any face you make can make another face. There are some numbers. You can make a face. Don't you think that's peculiar? <laughs> Does that not mean something?
uh, they occur, uh, butterflies also make letters. I'm going to say this is not a coincidence. There is some level of uh, patterns of difference that is that is very extreme. I must admit that's. Okay. Now I feel I must have missed bits of this story out, including a lot about plants. I feel I missed a bit out about plants out. Uh, plants have evolved to make a face or faces to enable bees to solve the type token problem. Yes? Can you say what the type token problem is? The, a, sorry, a bee goes out. Bees go out into the environment and they hunt for flowers. Therefore, flowers have to stand out of the environment. So, so I have missed this out. Flowers have to stand out from the green environment. Um, but they have to then fertilize a flower of the same kind. So all flowers have to be very recognizable. They have to be distinct and different. Um, so they recognize flowers as a type of object, as opposed to buildings, trees, pebbles. You recognize it as a flower. And then they have to recognize a token of the flowers, a, 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 a particular token, a particular kind of flower, and find the same one. Or rather, tell, go back to the hive and say, find flowers like this, and then they lead the bees back and say, you know, keep going on flowers of this type. So they have to recognize lavender, 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 as they empty the lavender of all the goodies and take it back to the hive. And that is done by flowers forming a contrast set formed by certain variables such as leaf shape, odor, color, size, swaying in the ring, wind, and all the rest of it. So they are a kind of natural alphabet. Oh. Hmm. Well, you wanted mad. That's great. <laughs> Let me... Um, the reason we have a language of flowers amongst humans, that you can codify flowers, you know, yellow is for jealousy, red is roses are for love, is because the same pattern of differences which is set out to help bees can be also applied and given a human meaning. And the fact that alphabets are picturesque in the far as everything shares features as a pattern of difference and similarity, that's the source of their beauty, is why they are beautiful for us. So flowers are naturally picturesque for a reason. Alphabets are not artificial, arbitrary objects. They are pseudo-natural. In fact, they are natural. These are a tree of descent. Okay. I'm going to stop, more or less, unless you, you know. Can we ask questions? Yeah, ask any question you want. Um, I, I wonder if the cells on I, I wonder if you're talking about individual things. Mm -hmm. And um, there's this quote from this cell, just been looking at um, where is it now? Sorry, I'm just going to find it. Um, that, right, here we go. So he's talking about individual objects. It's not, it, um, an individual object is not merely an individual object as such, a this here, an object never repeatable. As qualified in itself thus and so, it has its own specific character, its stock of essential predictables which must belong to it. If other secondary relative determinations belong to it. So this, I, I think he's saying that there's always a context. Yes. Um, so determining the individual and separating the individual from the context is a mistake. Uh, yes, there is always a context with, with which something in a contrast set exists. Things in contrast sets, of which I include um, character sets, uh, game tokens, the object exists with a few neighbors, and you always see it in the context of those neighbors. You always see a letter in the context of a letter, yes. of the other letters, and therefore it, it can be camouflaged, it can borrow features from, be an image of the other letters. That's how it vanishes. Yeah. But are we deceived in thinking that there's, there is an object? Is that a deception? That's, some, that's a trick. That we yes, it is. Um, the alphabet is a unified object. If you if you change one letter in a font, you have to change all the others. If you well, I can I can I can sorry. There's a bit I have read which is relevant to this. I make a claim. 
Uh, flowers form what I call a nondescript set. This set is self-camouflage. Camouflage involves an image. Each flower is in some way an image of all the others, enabling it to be camouflaged and hidden in all the others. Flowers form a whole, so that a change to one affects all the others. Um, flowers have no definition, no essence. What I'm saying is you can construct a set of objects which have no essence, no algorithm, yet is still coherent. When you, if, if, if there was a pattern to the alphabet which you were conscious of when you were reading, that would be information you do not want, which is noise. Therefore, all you want to know when you read is what the different letters are. You don't want anything, any, any other information whatsoever. So any pattern you have to become habituated to, you have to ignore. So letters are all black is information you do not need. And we will notice in Peter's representation of mathematics and yesterday, you know, we're now using colour in print. So that's an improvement. Are there any rules in, 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 in writing? U, sorry, Q is always followed by U. That is noise in writing. Although it is vanishing from English because we're now getting an importing words with just a letter Q. That's an improvement. Um, there is no algorithm. There is no pattern. You're talking about things with nothing to say except, I'm different. Um, features are most efficient when they occur with a probability of 0.5, because that's when the binary, binary entropy function is at a maximum. So in a good contrast set, features occur with a, with a, with a probability of about half. So you'll have like half red and half yellow, or you know, half round and half pointed. And that's the secret of being picturesque, you have a little bit of everything mixed together. Yeah. Um, I, I presume you would say the same thing about the collection of sounds that compose the, a language in, in a oral language where... Absolutely. Again, phonemes. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, phonemes. I, don't, I don't hear what you, uh, what you make, I only hear the words. I hear that's correct. Language. Phonemes are designed to vanish. But if you pronounce them slightly differently, I hear that you have an accent, which is noise. Right. So you have to learn to, it, the same thing happens to manners I and dress. To match an accent to you, somehow. Okay, and we dress to be invisible in the same way. If you stand out, you don't want to do that. <laughs> but actually, in regards to the... Now, one, one other yes. question. Yep. I, I have fantasized from time to time mm -hmm. that I could make an artificial alphabet that would be useful, but I never tried actually doing it. My method would be to take a small graph yeah. and take the set of maximal trees in the graph. This yes. is just a rule, but it produces all these somewhat, uh, who knows what, but they're somehow related, and they are, but who could tell how they're related? Yeah. That might work for a simple organism like a bee. For a human being, there are many other complexities. We are inventive, pattern-recognizing creatures. Therefore, if you gave me these different things, I might see a pattern in it, which you don't expect. Not, not, not saying... And it could become a, a stop point. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but one... What can an alphabet look like? The answer is it can't look like anything. It has to be look like nothing as a whole. But it can look like another whole, because all alphabets. So therefore, this is why um, another contrast set that says nothing is classical architecture. So an alphabet can look like classical architecture, and they do. So architecture and letters match each other. Uh, a Times is a classical font. You also have Gothic fonts. You have modern. Architecture and fonts go together. Not because, in order that, because classical architecture is inside me, I don't see it. It's invisible. I see the building. It can, therefore, manifest itself in a font. So you have these weird resonances in society where one where you have interfaces, contrast sets, they kind of transmit and share images of each other. So flowers will also occur in human decoration because they're a, they're kind of negative as a whole. You can have you, you have flowers in your clothes, you have flowers in on your wallpaper. And what is being copied is nothing. <laughs>
Um, so I was wondering, actually, in response to uh, adding to yeah. what Lou, uh, the yeah. application of phonemes in sound. Yeah. So I grew up speaking this weird trail mix of English, Hindi, Bengali, yeah. Uriya. Mm. And um, so in that case, there is no um, specific alphabet uh, that, I mean, you could take the maximal set of all the alphabets there, of there, all the languages. There is no middle. There is no, in an alphabet, there is no leading letter, there is no middle for the alphabet, there is no natural order of the letters, there is alphabetical order, but it's entirely arbitrary and it's noise. If, 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 if when you're reading and you say it's a letter A, first letter of the alphabet, that's noise. Mm -hmm. And it's arbitrary. Mm -hmm. You could do alphabetical order another way. So there is no center to any um, nondescript set. And I was also wondering, sorry, it's a completely unrelated meaning, but. Um the type kind of reminds me of phenotypes and Mendel, Mendelian sort of, you know, and I was wondering if there's, there's an added uh, uh, divergence to looking at laws of dominance and res 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 recessive and dominant sort of traits no, that there kind of there show is up no in types in, of flowers well, or natural natural forms. I was just wondering if that... No, there isn't. If there's a theme, if you can say anything about it, it shouldn't be there. And the first thing you do as an artist is get rid of it. This is allied to the fact, let me say this, I'll come to this, um, which I tell my students in design, when you, I have to, I have to express this in kind of sexist terms, you have, the late, women here have to make appropriate gender modifications. When you meet a pretty girl, there's nothing you can say. And a beautiful face brings you to silence. But if they're not, you know, when you meet someone who's ugly, boy, there's always something you can notice, isn't there? So when you see through a beautiful face is the one which is best at communicating because it is vanishing. So the beautiful font, this is why fonts wear out. We get used to them. They become passe. We begin to read and see patterns and we recognize, oh, it's times. It's Arial. Aren't you sick of times, New Roman? You should be. But in the fresh font, you'll read it faster, it's smoother, it vanishes. You see through it to the meaning. So this is why, you know, if you can see through it, it's beautiful. Sit. So this stuff meaning from these non-definable units or letters or whatever, um, wouldn't you need like a form of kind of like replacement or substituting equivalencies? where you would have something like, because your brain, you use as an example, fixates on a few details yeah. and fills in the rest of the context. Yeah. Well, in order to jump from the letters to the words to the sentence, you need, you need um, when you need something like a unit, like a uh, replacement rule that says this is equal to that, so then I can move up to this level yeah. to a sentence, and I can say, well, that's equal, I can replace mm -hmm. that letter with, or that word in this sentence with that novel can be replaced with text. Yeah. And you can start making higher and higher. And yeah, higher okay. I, I would say that words also form a nondescript set. And so do sentences and so do stories. You know, it's all it's, 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 all, it's all a pyramid of nothing. The um uh, sorry, you, you said something there. Uh, letters lost my thread. You said nothing, you said nothing. <laughs> sorry, think, think how difficult opti optical character recognition is. And you might say, why don't we just have one font? Wouldn't, wouldn't Microsoft optical character recognition be great if there was only one font? The other question is, why are there so many fonts? Because they wear out. They wear out for us because we are intelligent, pattern-reading animals. And we wear them out. And we discard them. And we have always need new fonts to keep reading. Um, when you read, you guess the letters from the words. You only need a, you, you are only smattering you know, you know what the words is, but an optical character recognition program, uh, as yet they cannot actually read and then work backwards to what the letter must have been. Think how we do handwriting. We figure out what the word might be and then we read the letters in. Isn't that also because we have an original data set? Yeah, we're hugely we intelligent. We, yeah. The, the letters and the text too. Yes, we so have an enormous making, like substitutions and replacements. We, have, we can guess what the message probably is and, and then kind of fill it in. Backwards, yeah. Um, 
I just was curious about that slide you skipped with the hands. If you don't want to talk about it. Okay. Sure, that was, that was an, an example of an interface where we, as it, um, I, can, I have a lot of examples of, of interfaces. One is the graphic user interface, uh, which is Macintosh, which is, believe me, weirder than you think. And it is, it's a kind of tactile thing. It's done with this thing called a mouse. And uh, we, we, you know, if you learn to type, you have to learn that that's E, 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 E. You know, it's E, I should be using that finger, you know. So you map the letters onto your fingers. And then your hands kind of vanish, you know. And you're connected to the machine through your fingertips. It's kind of creepy, you know. It's, uh, well, quite, you know, it's, 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 it's like the extended mind. But how do you connect yourself to a machine? How do you connect yourself to cyberspace? You use a mouse, this brick on a piece of string, and these keys. Oh, it's very odd. Yes? Not, uh, yeah. Just going back to what Sidney was saying, is it not a pyramid of habit? Yes, it is. It is. You are, you are habituated, you are absorbing it within into an internal model, so you don't think about it. But it doesn't, it doesn't not exist, though. It is still there, we're just... It's we're, we're, part of the perceptual process. We are, we are learning to ignore it, yes. So it doesn't exist in itself. It is not present to our... We're not conscious of it. We are dealing with it unconsciously. But surely... Our surely. Um, Surely time, then, is the most successful font, and because it's the most habituated. Um, no, but... The new fonts are the ones that don't work. No, times, you, you, you kind of recognize it. I can... A good font is one you can't recognize, and I'll bet you can't name the font in a book. But if it's times, you could. That's noise. I would say a good font is one that you don't know. Exactly. And you don't notice because he's me, he's that he's, he's that grey figure who just walked through the door. You just don't notice. It's kind of you. Um, but Comic Sans, which is a very bad font, you you would certainly recognise that, wouldn't you? And that would be noise. That's noise. So I'm saying the opposite to what you're saying. Yeah. I'm saying that Comic Sans is a terrible font because you, you, you we know it's Comic Sans because we see all the, oh it's very swirly. We can say something about it. So in fact, the last thing we need. Is to say anything is about a new it. font. No, and, um, new fonts are designed to vanish. A, a really good book font, not not a kind of display font that you put on an advertising package, which is designed to leap out. In a book, it's reading fonts are the beautiful things. There's some of the, and that's why reading fonts are so very hard to design. It has to be very similar to Times, but subtly different. So if you look at the difference between Times and Times New Roman, every letter has changed. Unbelievably, but and you can't really say what the difference is except it's fresh. So the same way, if you're beautiful and you know and and you know maybe you're this is why women I think change their hair, change their clothes. You, you change yourself subtly. You should never be the same. That is the secret of beauty. You have to keep moving. If you're the same, you become ugly. What's new? <laughs> so, so in, in the last couple oh, of days, <laughs> <laughs> it was turning into the QVC channel. <laughs> so, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Well, mm. As children learn, there's yeah. a certain primary font to use. Yes, I can understand okay. that. I believe that. And as you get older uh, and, uh, in education, I, I never thought about it before until you bring yeah. this up. Uh, as they go from the primary to pre kindergarten, mm. the font is very in your face so they can make the font so they can <laughs> not try to drop. Well, not so much large print, just there's a certain font. Mm. Circle, stick. Yeah. Yes, yeah, indeed. There's a letter uh, mm -hmm. A sometimes mm -hmm. is that squiggle yeah. that looks every now and then. Right. Yeah. But I think that's been abandoned. I'm not sure it's been lost. But you're also <laughs> learning how to make the letters with a pen. That's not six. Uh, when I was yeah. circle, stick, most of the letters. Okay. Yeah. Now as you move into 
cursive writing in, it becomes a, a bit more fluid. Yeah. So as the child gets older, or as you move along mm. in, in the school, and you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, you've conquered reading and you're getting more into um, context, but the fonts, I, I'm thinking now, I'm asking you, they get smaller and they, yes. they're not so much primary. Yeah. And as we get older, Thinking. and I think more and more, it's more, out of more fashion. about it, when I'm reading, yeah. at, at the age I am now, yeah. I have found some fonts uh, it, it, it easier on the eyes. <laughs> yes. Is that due to age, or yes. is that just, as you're saying, I'm, I'm, I'm just so used to it, or... or mm. I'm just, I'm trying to bring in, is there an age factor with human beings? That when, you're, when you're a child, you learn the forms of the letters, and as you become more experienced in reading, the fonts, you're kind of led in. You're learning to ignore. Well, like when you learn a language, you're very conscious of ici la plume de ma tante, and you're kind of doing your head. You learn, learn it's tacit knowledge, and you're throwing information away. You're learning to do it. Um, so fonts, what you, what you should ask is, why is every book in a different font? Why isn't there just one font? Fonts change every book you read. If you might go through your life and you might go about, I reckon about 500 million letters pass before your eyes in a, in a normal life. And it keeps changing form. And the reason it is, if it was always the same form, you would be able to say, I know that shape. But letters, you saw the example, the examples I had all the letter O's, letter S's. That that letter S changes every few hours. It's like a virus which is changing its shape in front of you, you know, in, in escaping your immune system. Can I have uh, a... Yeah. Yes, so um, we've been discussing laws of form and yeah. distinction. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is like a, a necker cube where you can see it in two different ways. Yes, they, they are things with two aspects. Yeah, yeah. and the one way is to, that you make um, the letter distinct. You yeah. see it as an individual. Yes but completely embedded in, in the way things are. There's another way of distinction, which is that you don't distinguish the individual, yeah. but you allow the individuals together to represent a meaning, which yeah. is distinguished as a whole. Correct. Yeah. And I think that the mathematics Lou's been doing, it applies to both those. Um, yeah. It doesn't just apply to the individuals and how yeah. they distinguish each other. You can use the same reasoning mm. to apply to how does that whole meaning mm. uh, distinguish itself and you've got this double yeah. um, whole and part. Indeed, it is, it, is, it is to do, the alphabet is a holistic thing, it is a whole. Mm. You can't throw a letter away and it's, you can't use a typewriter with one keyboard, you know. Um, it is a unified object which is creating these other holistic things in a chain, like with letters, then sentences, then stories. Yeah, and so, so it gives a huge amount of power to distinction, because it's not just one Indeed. thing trying to build it. it what, what a letter is, what an alphabet is, is a raw, unmarked state, out of which we can produce these other marked states. Something peculiar happened with the loss of form notation. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, a, a tiny language was created which had only one alphabetical symbol. Yes. Yes. But it was allowed to write symbols inside and outside. Of okay. Symbols, yes, you can put creating symbols in a, yeah. a huge variety of yeah. things that you could write with one symbol. Yes. Wow. Um, the mark. I think is an interface between the, the, the something we can name and something we can't. That's why I'm seeing it. Yeah, yeah. I don't it, it, and it's supposed to make a distinction, but yeah. it's only it's been cut in half. Yes. So so you can walk from the outside yes. to the inside. You can see it from the, you, it, it has two aspects. Yeah. Right. So my but take normal alphabets yeah. you don't get to write inside the letters unless you're an artist or, or no. Well, if you do that, they would become letters, you know, you, they would become objects, but they, they have to be not there to be useful. In order to be useful, a letter has to vanish. It gives its soul up for the good of the community. And I'm able to uh, expand on your comment, Lou, that you write a single mark, you've drawn a distinction, allegedly, 
basically, <laughs> half a distinction. But if you draw several more marks, you simply have built a pattern. And, the, and you right. may then recognize that pattern and apply the calculus and, and simplify yeah, it. And there are infinitely many patterns that you can... Oh, yes. It's, and it's a dance, a constant dance in that language. But, but, but I mean, uh, also given that we're not just talking about English or like reading from left to right, and then yeah. there are languages that are blocked or they have like smaller parts that are within a slightly bigger, some kind of nesting going on, yeah. and it's pictorial as well. Right? Yeah. And that, that uh, maybe that kind of reminds me a little bit about this mark within a mark sort of situation. Um, and I was just curious about the Necker cube uh, and, uh, and when you brought up Saussure uh, and the systematic play of differences or this sort of, um, and, and with regards to collage, because I think there's something interesting about collage as well. But I know that uh, I think Joao brought up something about in not ne not exactly perfect distinctions but perfect containment but there's some sort of overlap going on but whether um, uh, while say reading uh, these patterns emerge of like okay I I'm using the mark in a certain nested way and then uh, but if I start focusing in on one particular mark you say that that's not a good thing with regards to the flow of reading right but yeah. it's sort of like at some point and be like, oh, okay, but this is a distinction that I'm looking at, and that, yeah. that is kind of coming in the way. But I mean, that's always sort of there as in the background. Uh, but then, which is why I was thinking that, like, thinking about it as a complete erasure, a complete non, uh, like a double cross, um, I'm not sure if that is something that I would believe is what it is, because it still has its own form. It's still, you can still see it. There's still, you know, the arrangement that's on the page. Right, the it's, it's as, as Wittgenstein would say, two aspects. Right. But I'm wondering if it could be like a re-entering sort of, uh, or something that's oscillating, or not that, um, unless we want to look at it in a static way, that okay, like at this point I'm not really, at this moment while reading I'm not really thinking about the font, or, but that we, we go in and out of it in a, you yes, know. you do. But as we're skilled at reading, we go in so fast, we don't even notice, you know. Um, but if there's something wrong, if the, if, the, if, the, if the page is blurred, if your spectacles aren't working, you know, then suddenly you see letters. You don't, oh, there's a spelling mistake. You don't see letters until something goes wrong. It's like um, in phenomenology, it's just like a pr present and ready at hand. So a hammer is designed to be, what is it? ready at hand because it's smooth and it kind of swings with a hand and you don't see it, you don't see it till it's broken. In the same way you don't, letters are designed to vanish in, but the interface is to do with our brain. Or a bee's brain, yeah. And, and if you were into reading, say, a novel very strongly, yeah. the whole thing vanishes. Yeah, it, yes, even, yes the actual book vanishes. Yeah. We know further, the book is designed to vanish. Yeah. And the difficulty is with, with the, 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 not knowing that is why um, a Kindle isn't as good as you think it is. Why Adobe Reader is a, I just hateful because it doesn't have it, it is not designed to vanish properly. <laughs> and why books are so good. <laughs> That is that. They, uh, if a sans serif fonts are not so good for reading as with with serif, and you might wonder what serif, you know, how ser how serif contributes to that. The answer is no one's ever found out. Although I have some kind of an explanation here, I hope. Is it not? Yeah. Is it not that we are designed to value things? Yes. Indeed. Yes. Indeed. Yeah, but, but, but that's what I'm more interested in. Is is like. Like who, you know, who are we? What power in this? I mean, Stein has this thing about, yeah, about having like different senses. So it, we actually have like a, it's it's just a, a higher sense, like a sense of language. So um, where we are, which you, you know, which we grow in order to understand meaning, it, you know, with which we grasp meanings. Um, and this, I mean, I, this is, I don't know whether this is anything that kind of like 
cybernetics or anything? Well, I'm thinking uh, the viable system model. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about the difference between, uh, without going into it, system three and system four, the dynamic relationship mm -hmm. between those two I think is very, very relevant to this. Because um, one's codifying, the other is anticipating, giving up the soul to some extent. Well, what's this system for? This? So, so this is for Sack of Beer's stuff. We're going to Sack of Beer's archive on Thursday. Right. And uh, this is his, his, his model of a viable system. Um, and you can look at, at uh, uh, typeface as a viable system, I guess. Um, font. But um, it's, it's an interesting set of distinctions, but you know, there'll be more time to do it. Okay. Here's a famous advert illustrating the difference between two faces. One is definitely better looking than the other, but you can't say why. <laughs> what? <You> know, <laughs> okay. One of them is Audrey Hepburn, but come on, what are you going to say? I mean, the, well, the, the, it's the expression. There's a different expression, it's a different symmetry. One's more symmetric. Bigger mate. No, I mean, I think there you've got something because I think that the other one is more enigmatic and the lower one yes. is. Yes, yeah. the other one's is, more looking. Is saying something. Yes. Kind of like the hair is different. The light is darker. Did you see how the hair goes up here and it goes down? I, th I, th I think these are different w women. This advert came for, was published in the 1980s, I think, pre Photoshop. So this isn't some oh, modern. Underline. The, 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 the hair goes up and then it goes down. Um, See that little. Yes. That little thing just suggests something else. It's, 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 it's advertising Gordon's gin. Yes, but I don't see how. Um, it's saying Gordon's gin is, is Audrey Hepburn, and the other stuff is the woman down the road, you know. <laughs> I guess that's the gin. That's right. It, it is, it, you're saying it's the real thing. It's the real thing, it's nostalgia. Substitution. Substitution. Times and times new wrong. That'll do. Right. Any more questions? Any vital question? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Andrew, very much. Okay.